Okay, hi. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today and um, talk to a somewhat different crowd than what I'm used to. So um, I thought this being a neuroethics uh, meeting, of course, I would uh, focus on the science, but sort of try to put it in the context uh, a little bit of, of what we're all here to talk about today. Um, so um, in general, uh, what we're very interested in in my lab, and probably most of us in the room would find this very interesting, um, is uh, what makes the human brain uh, so special, what gives us our higher cognitive capabilities, and what, um, what goes wrong in neurological uh, disorders like uh, schizophrenia or, or autism. And so um, <clears throat> uh, this, I think, is an important point because actually um, it turns out that uh, you know, neurological disorders um, is a, a, um, a disease area that is really poorly um, treated, basically, by the pharmaceutical industry. And most of the pharmaceutical industry has basically dropped out of, uh, the, of neurological disorders in general. And this is a problem because it's really quite common. So I just put up a, a couple of these statistics. Um, about one in four um, people uh, will experience some sort of mental illness. And, um, and unfortunately, the amount of money that is spent on mental health um, uh, uh, research uh, really kind of pales in comparison to cancer, for example. And that's a problem because it, it is really an, an unmet uh, medical need. And so why is it such an unmet medical need? Well, it's because there's this um, issue with um, uh, testing of uh, pharmaceutical drugs for the treatment of, of mental illness. Um, there have been just huge amounts of drugs that have been successful in vitro, in neurons in vitro, for example, and in animal models. I mean, we've cured uh, spinal cord injury in mice many times, but we don't have any drugs that have actually made it in humans. And the same is true for epilepsy or schizophrenia. This is a really common um, story. And it's because of this sort of clinical trial cliff that basically the minute you move from these in vitro and in vivo uh, models and you move to actual human beings, suddenly those drugs don't work. In really bad cases, they actually have really toxic side effects. Um, and so basically uh, what we need is, is a new model system. We need something that's human um, that we can actually uh, hopefully uh, gain new insight into these neurological systems. And I think one of the reasons probably why especially neurological disorders suffer so much is because these are just diseases of a uniquely human uh, organ, our brains. And so um, that's where the work that uh, I've been involved in comes in. So, this is, I, I just sort of tried to put this a little bit in perspective from a, a kind of, um, just on a timeline to kind of give you a sense that this is really based on a, a lot of research, uh, what I'm showing you. Um, the work that I was involved in is the uh, generation of these cerebral organoids in 2013. But this uh, builds upon uh, research that was started, uh, I mean, I probably could draw this line all the way back to the beginning of the last century, but I'll start with this, um, uh, these neural stem cells that were isolated in 1989. And that was sort of a really key step to modeling brain development uh, in vitro and kind of kicks things off. Um, there were then these neural rosettes, which are sort of a better, better model of early uh, brain development, and then these uh, so-called SFVBQs, a uh, still better model than this. And then the first real sort of neural uh, organoids, uh, as we call them, uh, were these optic cup tissues. Um, and then uh, when I started work on this, I, um, uh, while I was a postdoc uh, working in Jurgen Knoblich's lab, I developed this cerebral organoid method, which is really kind of a, 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 a three-dimensional in vitro model of the human brain, but on a much smaller scale, and I'll show you what that actually is. Now, since then, there have been a number of other uh, methods described. I'm just showing, for example, these cortical spheroids from Sergio Pasca's lab. Um, and so uh, one of the sort of features of many of these methods is that they're sort of more directed in terms of their differentiation. They specifically make in separate, specific brain regions. So um, I'm not going to go into the details of how we make brain organoids, because I don't think that's really the point here. I think it's more like, what are these things and what can they do? But one important point is that we start with these embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, and that's important. You cannot make an organoid from anything else. It has to be from pluripotent stem cells, I mean a brain organoid. 
Uh, and then through a series of steps, uh, we end up with these really uh, beautiful large tissues. Um, one of the features of our method is that we put them in this uh, agitating vessel. This is one example. This is an orbital shape, um, sorry, a spinning bioreactor. And there's a video here, oh, it even has sound, uh, where you can see these little blobs of brain tissue floating around in there. Okay. So, um, right. So, uh, you know, I've been saying that we need a better model because we need something to model neurological disease. Well, the first thing we did with this was to tackle a genetic form of microcephaly. And the reason we did that is because microcephaly is very poorly modeled in animal models. When you make a, a mutation in mice that would cause microcephaly in humans, you usually see no effect, and sometimes it's just a very minor effect on brain size. Whereas the patients, you can see this patient in particular has, has a really severe reduction in brain size. So clearly animal models are insufficient for modeling this disorder. So it's a good example to start with. So we actually got uh, stems, uh, sorry, we got skin cells from this patient and then we reprogrammed them to induce pluripotent stem cells. So this is a well-known um, process that uh, won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. Basically you take these skin cells and you just sort of convert them back to a stem cell state. And then we can start from those stem cells and then differentiate them into our brain organoids. And when we did that, we could recapitulate the uh, decreased size um, uh, of these tissues. And then we went on to use these to start looking at the mechanism of that and found that there was a defect in the way that the neural stem cells were dividing and the way that they were making neurons. So I think Hopefully, this uh, speaks to the power of organoids and, and what they are capable of in terms of hopefully modeling neurological disease. But the thing that we're all kind of concerned about, of course, is, well, what if they could think? We've got neurons in there. It's a ball of tissue that has a little bit of the kind of architecture of a brain. So, uh, you know, that's something we should all be thinking about. <laughs> And so um, I would like to just, in order to sort of put this in context, I would like to talk about several features of organoids from a scientific standpoint and just sort of then try to put them in the context of what we might be concerned about in terms of a thinking brain organoid. So although I think it's really difficult to define where consciousness and even cognition really or at least human level cognition really comes from and what, what all needs to happen in order to be a sentient being. I think most of us, and we can talk about this over the discussion session, everything, because I'm sure there will be people who are gonna disagree with me, but I'd just like to put this out there. I think most of us would agree, would agree that it is an emergent property of a very complex neural network. And I think there are certain features that that neural network probably needs to have um, in order to, uh, exhibit a human level, which is kind of what we're most concerned about, right? So one of the features of our brains is that it has a very specific organization. It's not just neurons randomly mixed up together and connecting with each other. There is an order to it. Another feature of our brains compared with other animals is we have very large brains. So if you measure something called the encephalization quotients, this is something we're very interested in my lab because we're very interested in size and, and from an evolutionary perspective. If you measure encephalization quotient, which takes into account the body size, so in general in animals, as body size increases, so too does brain size, because it's an organ of the body, it grows as well. But in humans, our brain has grown much more than the rest of our body. So we have an encephalization quotient of around seven. Um, a mouse has an encephalization quotient of 0 0.5. So that just sort of hopefully puts it in perspective. So we have a really big brain. And sort of related to this, um, of course, size is then going to be in, uh, influenced by the number of neurons. I think, obviously, with a bigger brain, you're going to have more neurons. But related to this is also the complexity of those different neuron types. Uh, there should, there's going to be a lot of different types of neurons in there, and that's, that's going to be important for, that, for the level of that um, uh, or the complexity of that neural network. Maturity, obviously, you need to have mature neurons. So neurons need to actually be able to fire with each other and they need to have a morphology that also mimics that. They need to have complex dendrites to connect with each other and dendritic spines to make synapses and contact each other. And finally, they need to have some sort of interaction with the environment. Um, this is kind of based on sort of classic neuroscience studies where if you deprive a neural network 
of sensory inputs, but also output, then you do not get a complete, you don't get a functional circuit. So I want to just sort of look into each of these characteristics, again, from a scientific standpoint, just see what, what do organoids actually have. So first of all, spatial organization, of course, the brain we know has all of these uh, different <coughs> lobes. Um, there's been a lot of um, interest in what part of the brain might, ha uh, might hold consciousness. This is a very controversial area, but for example, Christoph Koch would argue that there's these um, sort of hot spots in specific lobes of the brain that are connecting uh, with each other. But regardless, there is this very specific uh, organization. All of us in this room have this basic architecture. And so what about organoids? So if we look at our organoids, this is a movie through an entire organoid. And what you're looking at is just all the cell bodies. And basically, uh, and then we see a, um, a reconstruction of all the ventricles. These are the fluid-filled spaces within the brain. And basically what you're looking at is um, essentially small lobes. So each one of these little things is like a little, little miniature lobe, kind of similar to an entire hemisphere of a cortex. So they have the same kind of architecture of a, a cortex, but there's a whole bunch of them. So if we look through just a single section, you can see there are several of these little lobes. And each one of these lobes is basically like a, 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 a cerebral cortex hemisphere. So I actually um, happen to bring some organoids with me. For those of you who've never actually seen any cerebral organoids, I thought it might be helpful to actually see what it is we're talking about. These are fixed, they're not dangerous, these are human, and they're embedded in gelatin so that they'll just um, hold still in here. But you can see there's several of them, some are larger and some are smaller because they're different stages. So I'm gonna pass it around. And the reason I'm passing it around, sure. The reason I'm passing it around now is because if you look closely, you can see these little sort of bulges coming out. And so now I need my models as well. No, I need them, Julian. Yeah. Somebody well, they've got formaldehyde, so that probably wouldn't be very good as well. At least Australia. <laughs> okay. So, um, so the these, if you look closely, you'll see these little lobes, and this is kind of we made we have these um, models of of organoids to kind of try to better illustrate the architecture. So. This is kind of what it looks like from the outside. I hope that kind of looks similar to what you're seeing up there and what you see in the, in the tube there. And each one of these little like bulges coming out is one of these kind of little lobes, okay? And if you open it up, what you would see is these fluid-filled spaces here and a very specific layering, which is also what you're seeing here on this stain. In green are the neural stem cells. In red are a special population of intermediate cells that are uh, on their way to making neurons, and on the outside are the neurons. And that's this kind of very stereotypic layering. And so how does that compare with an actual brain? Well, it's, it's great for looking at neurogenesis because this layering architecture is really important for generating neurons. And if you look at a fetal brain, so I hope many of you can recognize that looks like a brain, this would be a model of an actual human fetal brain. And again, if you open it up, what you'd see are these fluid-filled spaces and the same kind of layering. And so that's what we're most interested in in my lab, is how that layering happens, how the neurons are generated by these neural stem cells, and sort of how many neurons are made. But as you can see, the architecture is different. I mean, the individual lobes look very similar to an individual little, you know, part of a, corti of a, of a cortical hemisphere, but it has six or seven hemispheres, whereas, of course, we only have two. And sometimes it might have three retinas on it, which is the neural part of the eye, or, you know, two cerebellar regions, or, you know, brain stem, a couple of those, whereas you should only have one. So the overall architecture is not really there. Um, but on a sort of more micro scale, we can uh, see a similar kind of architecture uh, in terms of the cell, cellular architecture. So that's what we do. We basically, in my lab, we basically just focus on each of these little lobes and we look at those in sort of in isolation and try to see what the neural stem cells are doing in there. And so um, this is another way of visualizing this. You see the neural stem cells here that are very dense. The neurons migrate outward. And 
Again, I'd like to just sort of put this into context and show you another example of a similarly organized tissue that has already been described for a long time, and that is neuroblastoma, a tumor where if you cut open, so sometimes, not always, but specific types of neuroblastoma will actually show architecture that looks a lot like a brain organoid. It's quite amazing to me that the, the kind of architecture you see there. You have neural stem cells, you have plenty of neurons, um, and, and oftentimes, of course, these things can be really quite large and much, much larger than, than the types of tissues we're dealing with. But again, although it doesn't have the overall architecture, we can model at least these sort of um, the, the cellular behaviors, which is what we're interested in. Now let's think about size. So I'm putting three example tissues up here, and one of them is an organoid. Those of you that have already looked at the organoid in the, in the little thing might be able to guess which one is an organoid, but I will now put it up. So this is a crayfish brain, this is our organoid, and this is a zebrafish brain. Now these are all to scale. To put it a little bit more in scale, here's a mouse brain. So you can see our organoids, are, they can get to be quite large, but of course, how does that compare with an actual human brain? In order to compare this with a human brain to scale, we have to seriously scale these guys down in order to fit the human brain on there. So, and you, you can see in the, in the tube, they're very small. So, you know, we're really excited about them, but I just to put them in context in terms of the actual human brain, they're very small. Um, and then of course, neuron number, which is related to size, but not, nece not necessarily a perfect linear relationship. Well, a cockroach brain has around a million neurons. A zebrafish brain has around 10 million neurons. A mouse brain has around 71 million. And of course, the human brain, uh, maybe not this guy, I don't know, has, <laughs> depending on who you are, has around uh, 86 billion. So where do the organoids lie in this? Well, um, most of the organoids that we work with are around a million, but there have been reports of up to 2 million. So we'll put it somewhere between these guys. Just again, to sort of put this into context, you have around 500 more, 500 times more neurons than this in your gut. So there's, again, a really big difference between you know, the number of neurons that we're actually generating and um, the stuff that, that we typically deal with. So, um, okay, and then the complexity of different neuron types. Now there's a huge complexity. This is just an example. These are just a cortical neurons, and I don't think they're all even on here, but you have these excitatory glutamatergic neurons over here uh, under this blue, <coughs> and you have these um, inhibitory interneurons. And there's a huge variety in different morphologies and what they, uh, their actual function as well. And that's really important. These different cell types really have to interact with each other in order to make a functional network. So do we have these different cell types in an organoid? Actually, this is one area where I think organoids are a really good model. They actually do show a whole wide array of different neuron types. Um, we still need to characterize those neurons much better, but molecularly, in terms of their molecular identity, there is uh, a lot of, um, there do seem to be the various different types of neuron, uh, of different neural populations in there. Um, but, uh, of course, the morphology is also part of that complexity. Um, and in vivo, we have this, all these different types of neurons with different, you know, complex dendritic trees and different shapes, and that's really important for their function as well. And so um, in organoids, unfortunately, that is one area where we haven't quite got there yet. Neurons in organoids are really quite simple. They put out these very simple dendrites, um, branch a couple of times, but we never really see this beautiful um, complex um, architecture. And this, it's really interesting because actually in 2D, um, that it seems you can get cells or neurons to become more complex in their morphology than what we've been able to do in organoids. And I'm not sure what the difference is there. Maybe it's just time or maybe the media formulations aren't right yet, so maybe we'll get there. Um, so, but in 2D, you can actually get quite complex um, neurons with dendrites and dendritic spines here. That's what I'm showing here. But I have to say that in 2D, you, don't, you still don't see all of this complexity. For example, these Purkinje cells down here with these really highly complex dendritic trees, that, is not, that has not been recapitulated in any form in vitro. Uh, okay, and then, of course, functional. That's one thing we, you know, we really care about. Now, this is work from Paola Arlata's lab where they um, showed that um, organoids do show spontaneous 
neural activity. This was using an electrode to measure spontaneous activity. You can see these beautiful action potentials here and these um, spike, uh, these spontaneous spikes. So that suggests neurons are active in there. We had also previously shown using a calcium dye that we can see spontaneous neural activity. But is that sort of enough to say that it's really a mature network? Well, one of the sort of measurements of kind of a more mature network is, or of more of a more mature neuron in terms of function, is the sp um, spontaneous firing rate. So this is in, typically uh, reported in Hertz. And so in vivo, in the neocortex, uh, an av you would normally see an average spontaneous firing rate of around 12.86 Hertz. So what about these organoids? Well, again, in Paula's paper, they described, they show the mean spike rates, and they're getting a mean of about 0 0.38, so it's quite a lot lower. Again, we can look at 2D, because there, again, the neurons can get a little bit more mature. And there they can show, um, if you let neurons uh, mature in culture in 2D for a very long time, then you can get up to 6.5 hertz. So getting closer, but still not quite to the level that you see um, in vivo in the actual brain. So what about input and output? So I briefly mentioned that both of those are really important for functional network. Well, this comes from really classic studies. This is actually from my neuroscience textbook that I have in my office and that I read in my undergrad, um, where if you deprive an animal from, from a visual stimulation, then um, there's a particular critical period when the network of uh, the brain response uh, develops in response to that light. So if you, for example, if you deprive one eye, if you basically just cover the eye of an animal during that critical period, uh, then the corresponding cortical region in the visual cortex will show an underdevelopment of these um, uh, dendritic trees. These neurons will basically not, be, not form a functional network and they won't respond to light. Even after you remove the um, cover from the eye and the retina is perfectly functional, you can shine light on the retina and record from the retina itself. It's perfectly functional, but that animal is functionally blind in that eye because there is this critical period when it needs to have that input. But it's not only input, because there's this classic, what's called kitten carousel experiment. Now this is from the old days when neuroscientists used to do sort of horrible experiments on kittens. We don't do these anymore, don't worry. But um, it's an interesting experiment. So what they've done here is, in this case, they haven't covered any of the eyes of either of the animals here. All they've done is basically they've, they've reared these kittens in the dark so they couldn't see anything. And then right when the critical period comes where that part of their brain would start responding to light, they then move them to a chamber, a room where they can see and there's light and there's visual cues so they can start to sort of learn about you know, vision. And one cat can interact with its environment here, but it's connected through this like rope and a, and a little sort of pulley thing that can move around, uh, and then another rope to another kitten. And this kitten is held in a container, and it can see. So both cats can see. Both cats have their eyes open. But basically, the difference is this cat can interact with its environment, and this cat cannot. And if you do that during that critical period, and then you take those cats out of there, and you then measure their vision, this cat is functionally blind, even though it had its eyes open the whole time. So basically saying that not only do you need to be able to see the thing that you're learning about, you also need to be able to interact with it. And I think this kind of fits also with the this sort of unfortunate cases of children who've been in deprived environments where they've been deprived of, of um, you know, stimulation. Those kids who've unfortunately been kept in a basement for some time, for example. And there's, again, there's a critical period. And if if, um, if that happens to a human child, then even after that, that time, if you take them out and put them in a stimulating environment, they'll never fully recover. They will be intellectually disabled for the rest of their lives. So um, it, it is really, I think, what it tells us is that the, a functional network of any sort, this applies to vision, so this is vision, but I think people have shown it to be the case with um, hearing and other forms of sensation, that uh, a neural network needs to have both input and output. So what about organoids? Well, again, work from, uh, well, so first of all, one of the things that we initially described in our paper was the presence of these pigmented regions. This is retinal pigmented epithelium of the retina, the neural part of the eye. 
So in theory, it might respond to light. And so in fact, what again, Paolo Arlotta's lab showed was that if you shine light on an organoid that has this pigmented epithelium, and then you record from somewhere else in the organoid, you can see uh, a response. Now in this case, you see a dampening of neural activity in response to the light. Um, I would like to again put this a little bit in context. So in this paper, they were, they, I think they measured from 25 or 26 neurons and they saw a response in four. So it was fairly limited. Maybe if they recorded more, they would see more. Now in our brains, of course, we have around 280 million light dependent cells in our human you know, primary visual cortex. So we're still pretty far away, again, probably because they're just much smaller and less complex. Okay, so to kind of recap what I just told you, I think probably we're pretty far from spatial organization. It's really disorganized. Um, the size and number of neurons is on the order of a cockroach. Um, the functional maturity, they're very immature still at the moment. And the input and output, again, I don't think we have, we, we haven't put both together. Um, and so that's, you know, not yet, I'd say. <clears throat> so basically I'd say we're pretty far away. But, you know, why are we all here? There, we're obviously, we want to think about this and where might we go in the future. So um, there are various ways that uh, people are working on improving organoids, and there's probably also many uh, future improvements yet to come. One uh, idea, which has uh, not been done, but just something that uh, people have been talking about, is the idea that we might actually be able to guide the organization of organoids and actually give them cues to tell them where to build a cortical lobe, where to build a cerebellum, you know, and where to build a retina, so that you would end up with a tissue that has the architecture that's a little bit closer to an actual brain. That's still not done at all. Um, we don't understand the cues yet. That's, the problem is the developmental biology isn't there to support that yet. We don't know what cues actually control all that very well. But if we have more information from developmental biology, maybe we'll be there one day in the future. Um, in terms of size and neuron number, well, this is a recent, uh, this is from a recent um, uh, review that, uh, that I wrote about uh, another paper that came out in Nature Biotechnology from Rusty Gage's lab, where they actually transplanted human brain organoids into a mouse. And this was really quite remarkable because they got a lot of uh, really beautiful vascularization, which was a huge step. Um, they could increase neuronal survival because organoids have this problem that, of course, the very center of them is uh, dead, basically, because they're not getting any nutrients. But in this case, they could uh, get those cells to survive for much longer. Um, of course, the size is still highly limited. You've got a rodent-sized cranial cavity not to mention the surrounding brain tissue, it can't really grow very much. It in fact, it doesn't grow beyond the size that it was. In fact, it actually shrinks initially. And then it returns back to its original size, but it never actually gets bigger than what it was when they, with what they started. Um, the, in terms of the maturity aspect, uh, there's been a lot of work on neurons you know, in 2D and maturing them. And as I mentioned, we can get them much more mature in 2D. But uh, transplantation of human uh, 2D-derived neurons, I think, really tells us that basically it seems that human neurons, even if you put them into a mouse, they follow their own intrinsic timing and they take uh, you know, up to nine months to look like a mature neuron. So there is this sort of intrinsic timing. So one just basically has to wait, probably. And finally, the input-output aspect. Um, I think maybe these multi-electrode arrays are going to be where we're going to find uh, the ability to potentially do that. Uh, these, can, these are electrodes that can activate and uh, um, record um, activity. And so now, uh, just in the last uh, slide, I want to just show you sort of where, how this fits with other types of brain surrogates. So animal models are actually a brain surrogate for studying the human brain. We use them to try to understand our brains. And um, they, of course, depending on the animal and depending on your personal viewpoint, some of them would be considered sentient. Um, 2D culture, of course, is another approach that people take. And there, people have reported some pretty amazing things, even short-term memory. Um, brain tumors could even be a model system. People aren't really doing it, but you might even be able to use a brain tumor to try to understand how neurons are made or how they function, because you could get a lot of neurons out of a brain tumor. 
Um, but of course, we're not really very concerned when we take a brain tumor out and we throw it in the bin, right? Um, ex vivo tissue is, of course, another approach people use. You can get really quite large tissues from this. And these are very mature because they've already been completely matured in the person's brain. And finally, um, chimeras and transplantation. This is an area where, so I mentioned the transplantation already, where you can get these organoids to be vascularized. Another approach that's kind of related is the idea of transplanting human stem cells into a blastocyst, and then those cells would then contribute to the animal. This is a little bit, this is something where I think we probably have to spend some more time talking about, because depending on how well they contribute to the blastocyst, you could, in theory, generate an entire human brain in that animal. And if it's a large mammal, then it could support the size of a human brain. So, okay, and so basically I sort of just put this up. So for organoids, I think potentially maturity, we could get there and potentially input and output, but I don't think that we're very close to organization and size. For 2D culture, actually, you could, in theory, make an unlimited number of neurons because you just need a really big dish, but you're still lacking the organization, of course. For brain tumors, even, um, this is I put as a question mark because who knows, but you completely lack the organization. For ex vivo tissue, you've got the organization of maturity, but of course you don't have an entire human brain. We're not gonna grow a whole human brain ex vivo, and you don't have the input and output. Animal models actually already have many of the features we're talking about, but I think the thing that really separates humans from mice is probably brain size. There's many other specific, more subtle things, but brain size is probably the biggest. And I think this is where, like I say, we probably need to talk about this more, because again, as I said, in theory, you could potentially make a fully formed human brain in a pig. So um, I just thought I would put this up really quick just to say what we currently go through in the UK and how we're doing. And um, actually, just to sort of sum up this, because I know I'm short on time, um, one of the features that I think needs some um, more thought is where IPS cells are concerned. So we have to go through a lot of oversight when it comes to animal work and even ES cells. So because we start with pluripotent stem cells and we start with embryonic stem cells, we have to get approval from the UK Stem Cell Board. Because my research is funded by the ERC, I also have to get approval from them. We have to get approval for anything we want to do with animals from AWERB and from the home office. But the IPS cells, we have to get patient consent, of course, but it doesn't always specify what you're going to do with the IPS cells. And so um, finally, I think, I hope I've convinced you that brain organoids are powerful, despite all of these very sort of specific things. Um, but I do think they're pretty far away. But in terms of thinking about this in the larger context of brain surrogates, um, I think by if we can limit at least one of these and maybe more, then I think you're probably, I would argue, not going to reach the point of at least human cognition. And so my kind of final suggestions would be that we reconsider the way that we do patient consent for IPS cells and that animal chimeras, especially with large mammals, need to have some good ethical oversight. And with that, yeah, that's it.